So thank you all for being here today. Uh, I would like to talk to you a bit about uh, revisiting post-acute COVID-19 syndrome. So in terms of disclosures, uh, I have one disclosure I consulted for Iliad in the past year. And also would like to note that the opinions expressed in this presentation do not represent the views of the United States government or the United States Department of Veterans Affairs. In terms of outline, I'd like to discuss today what led us to study long COVID and then talk about what is long COVID. Some people refer to it as post-acute sequela of COVID-19 as well. And then try to draw a bit of a comparative evaluation between COVID-19 and seasonal influenza. And then conclude with implications for health systems and communities. So first, before we started talking about or thinking about long COVID, our, our group met at very, very early of the you know, very early phase of the pandemic to discuss how do we do our part to help solve problems in this pandemic. And it became evident to us that we do what we do best is that we should identify knowledge gaps that are important from public health perspective and try to address them using our research. And it was very clear to us from a very early phase of the pandemic that some people that got COVID-19 are not really fully recovering even weeks after the initial infection. The first Sentinel report was actually in the form of an op-ed piece by Fiona Lowenstein in New York Times back in April 2020, where she said, we need to talk about what coronavirus recoveries look like. And she recounted her story. She told her story. She's young and previously healthy. She got COVID-19. Now, weeks after the initial infection, she is still having fatigue, shortness of breath, lingering cough, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this wasn't the virus that everybody was telling us it was, in that it's a respiratory virus only that infects you, and you get you know you get you know sick for a few weeks, and then you fully recover afterwards. That really was the first glimpse from a report and in the form of an op-ed piece in New York Times that you know coronavirus is actually maybe resulting in long-term manifestations and even in young people. What we didn't know at the time is that this report really galvanized a community of patients, a community of, of, of people who were also suffering from coronavirus, who got the coronavirus, and weeks after the initial infection were actually still having problems, lingering fatigue, brain fog, weakness, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And really kudos to that or credit to that, you know, patient community, they coalesce around each other following the publication of that report in the New York Times, and they formed the Patient-Led Research Collaborative, really a wonderful, wonderful patient-led movement. So this Patient-Led Research Collaborative galvanized interest in long COVID. They were the first people to really survey their membership and publish a report in which they said their members who had long COVID weeks after the initial infection, they were still having lingering fatigue, lingering weakness, brain fog, muscle pain, and a number of other manifestations. And they coined the term long COVID and started refer referring to themselves as long callers. So at this juncture, very early in the pandemic, we became aware that a lot of patients are not really fully recovering from COVID-19. And that led us to really, you know, you know, develop our research agenda and, and our intent to evaluate and study COVID-19. So we asked the first question, what is long COVID? What is long COVID? So, and we did the first systematic characterization of long COVID-19 in, in the sense that we, we took an unbiased, uh, nearly a hypothesis-free approach to, you know, comprehensively evaluate all the post-acute sequela of COVID-19. And our results show that COVID-19 can affect nearly every organ system. It can provoke mental health problems in the form of anxiety, depression, sleep problems, substance abuse. It can lead to nervous system manifestations, including stroke, headache, memory problems, and smell problems. It can actually also provoke metabolic disturbances, including new onset obesity, new onset diabetes, and hyperlipidemia or high cholesterol. 
Long COVID is also characterized by increased GI manifestations or increased risk of GI or gastrointestinal manifestations in the form of constipation, diarrhea, acid reflux disease, skin disorders, hair loss, and skin rash. Coagulation disorders is very, very important in the form of blood clots, blood clots in the legs, what we call deep vein thrombosis, and uh, blood clots in the lungs, or that's referred to as pulmonary embolism. There are really a myriad abnormalities in the cardiovascular system in the form of acute coronary disease, heart failure, palpitations, arrhythmias, respiratory problems, including cough, shortness of breath, low blood oxygen, kidney problems, including acute kidney injury, chronic kidney disease, musculoskeletal problems, including joint pain, muscle weakness, and general problems, including malaise, fatigue, and anemia. And as you can appreciate from the slide, you know, our conclusion from that study that COVID-19 can produce sequelae in nearly every organ system, wherever we look in the body, whether it's the brain, heart, lungs, kidneys, GI, or the coagulation system, or the musculoskeletal system, there was evidence of post-acute sequelae in that organ system. So it led us to the conclusion that COVID-19 can affect nearly every organ system, and that long COVID is really a multi-system disorder that can involve multiple sequela in nearly every organ system. Then we went on to do a, an investigation or an examination of what does post-COVID-19 look like vis-a-vis -a, -vis a post seasonal influenza infection. That is, if you compare it to another respiratory virus that's been well characterized, we've had it for more than 100 years. If you study people with post-COVID versus post-flu, how do they stack up? How do they really compare? So what we concluded in the study was that the magnitude of risk is higher in people with COVID-19 versus seasonal influenza. The magnitude of risk of post-acute sequela was higher. And then two, that the breadth of organ involvement, the extensive you know, sequela that we have in post-COVID is really unmatched in, in post-seasonal influenza. So they really do not compare you know, post-COVID viral illness is characterized by extensive involvement of organs and higher risk. And that's not really present to that extent in people with post-influenza or post-seasonal influenza, you know, syndrome. So we concluded that it's a really a different kind of post-viral syndrome. It's really a, a, really a totally different kind of post-viral syndrome. And then we want to, and then we said to, uh, to ourselves, like, is the risk really confined? Is the risk of post acute sequela or the risk of long COVID, is it really confined to people who really had very bad COVID in the first place, to people who really were very sick, who needed to be hospitalized for extended period of time or hospita hospitalized at all, and uh, or needed to be in the intensive care unit? And the evidence suggests that the risk was evident even among non-hospitalized. That means that the risk was, was present even in those people whose disease was not severe enough to necessitate hospitalization, whose disease was mild and in some cases asymptomatic and did not necessitate hospitalization. And of course, we found that the risk increased in a graded fashion according to the severity of acute infection. So two lessons here, that the risk was actually present so that people can have long COVID even with asymptomatic infection. And even when the infection is really very mild in the beginning and did not lead to hospitalization in the first 30 days of infection. However, the risk is actually much more pronounced and much higher in people who had a very severe disease in the first place. And there are uh, several sequela of concern that really concern us in this, in this, uh, in, in long COVID. First, really the burden of mental health disorders. What, what I've told you now so far is that with long COVID, we see higher risk of depression, anxiety, you know, PTSD, sleep disturbances, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we think these deserve attention now before they balloon or, or, or become a much larger crisis down the road. 
We also see in the US really increased use of opioids in people with long COVID. And this is really alarming because the US went through the you know, horror of the opioid epidemic you know, prior, several years prior to the you know, beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. And as a result, you know, really a lot of people lost their lives, et cetera, et cetera. And what we see now a trend toward increased opioid use in people with long COVID. We think that that really demands attention now to curb unnecessary use of opioids and really hopefully you know, stem or reduce the risk of another opioid epidemic down the road. We, th we see increased burden of cardiovascular disorders of cardiovascular disease. And this is really alarming because those conditions, cardiovascular disease is a chronic disease that lasts a lifetime. This is not a sequela that comes and, and goes in a few months. You know, let's say you know, fatigue, one can imagine that fatigue might actually improve with time. But, but cardiovascular disease, if people have you know, heart failure or other manifestations, those are manageable conditions for sure. You know, they can be managed, but a generally chronic condition that scar people for a lifetime. We also see, and we are concerned about nervous system and neurocognitive disorders, including brain fog and, and dementia and, and, and stroke and, and other nervous system disorders. And as I alluded to earlier, we also see increased risk of metabolic or cardiometabolic conditions, including diabetes and kidney disease. And those, again, are non-communicable diseases that are chronic in nature. They're certainly manageable. One can manage diabetes and kidney disease, but these are chronic conditions that will stick with people that would affect them for a lifetime. They're associated generally with early mortality and reduced life expectancy. So, so those are really have profound consequences on the burden of non-communicable disease down the road. So we think long to COVID alt altogether might result in a rise in the burden of non-communicable diseases over the next decade. And people can be asking now that how can a respiratory virus called SARS-CoV-2, which supposedly is a virus that infects the lungs, a respiratory virus that infects the lungs, produce so many extra pulmonary manifestations or manifestations or sequela in so many organ systems. And the short answer to this is that we really do not completely know why. There are several hypotheses. One leading hypothesis is that the spike protein on the surface of SARS-CoV-2 attaches itself to an ACE2 receptor, which is present in many cell types, including lungs, kidneys, heart, liver, brain, pancreas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's, you can think of it as almost like the SARS-CoV-2 has the key to the lock on the surface of the cell. Once it engages that lock, it really, it, it, it facilitates then entry of the virus into those cells. And this theory or this hypothesis is being currently investigated in, in multiple avenues around the world to gain a deeper understanding of how can a virus a respiratory virus really provoke damage in so many organ systems outside the lung. There are other possible, you know, uh, conceptual models, uh, and, and this is really one conceptual model to sort of like really, you know, think or, or sort of frame our thinking around uh, long COVID. You know, certainly there is a, a direct pathway, we think, a, a pathway that in, invol, involves the virus itself in, in which, you know, either the virus properties themselves, you know, including that spike protein and other virus properties, or the immune response to it may actually provoke, you know, organ damage and post-acute sequela. It is also possible, and we really should not ignore the potential presence of indirect pathways. That is, people where they are infected with COVID-19 in the context of the pandemic, that might lead to loss of employment, reduced social contact and isolation, changes in dietary habits, changes in the physical environment or physical activity, and other stressors, including grief, trauma, and other env environmental or contextual exposures that altogether may actually then amplify baseline risk or produce new sequela. And certainly last but not least, you know, the idea that, you know, some people may actually be living with, may have been living with diabetes for a long time. And these were unrealized, you know, pre-existing conditions that, you know, then, you know, became realized in, in, in the context of getting, you know, COVID-19 and then subsequently, you know, getting uh, increased healthcare utilization or increased care um, as a result of COVID-19. So all those factors may coalesce to either produce new onset disease 
or might result in amplification of baseline risk and progression of subclinical conditions or discovery of previously unrealized conditions. And that might, might lead to the phenotype that's called post-acute sequela of COVID-19, what we also refer to in this presentation as long COVID, that can involve multiple organ systems. So we think, we think long COVID is really a, a major health crisis in the US. And it's really, again, perfectly captured in another op-ed piece by Fiona Lowenstein and Hannah Davis, in which they say, you know, COVID, long COVID is not rare, it's a health crisis. And they say, you know, a year later, we struggle to be taken seriously. Few think long COVID can happen to them or that it will affect their post-pandemic life. But long COVID is not a footnote to the pandemic or a curious human interest story. It is America's next big health crisis and we should prepare for it now. And we cannot agree more. And we certainly agree with the sentiment. And we also think that long COVID you know, will exact or will actually cast a long shadow on, on multiple avenues of our life. So we think that the toll of hospitalization and death that we measure currently from the acute COVID is really only the tip of the iceberg. And that post-acute COVID or long COVID will provoke disease and disability, early mortality, and will affect life expectancy. We'll have broad economic implications. We'll have broad social economic, uh, social implications and, and might provoke um, you know, uh, global unrest in some pockets around the world. So that's really what's beneath the, top of, the tip of the iceberg. And that's really substantial and, and could really, uh, uh, you know, really last with us for and shape our lives uh, for decades to come. So now what are the implications for health systems? The burden of long COVID is likely substantial. We estimate anywhere between four to 10% of people with COVID-19 uh, will have long COVID. Long COVID is a multifaceted disease that can affect nearly every organ system. As we discussed earlier, it might result in rise in the burden of chronic diseases, including rise in the burden of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and kidney diseases. It is imperative, we think it's very, very important, it's imperative that the governments and health systems prepare for the type of patients in need of post-COVID care. The UK national health system is starting to develop this. The US VA healthcare system is developing the uh, post-COVID clinics and several other systems in the US are also developing post-COVID clinics. We think, we think this is really the way to go to deliver you know, optimal care for people with long COVID. We also know that many post-COVID conditions can be managed by primary care providers with the incorporation of patient-centered approaches. Some patients will require multidisciplinary care. The optimal composition of those post-COVID clinics is not really clear yet, but we think it should include providers who are able to address respiratory, cardiometabolic, mental, and neurologic sequela. What are the implications for communities? The best way to prevent long COVID in communities is really to prevent COVID through vaccination. That will remain, remains a try and true method to really prevent the disease in the first place, to really hopefully stem the, the uh, downstream consequences of having long COVID. And all, uh, actually also the active combating of misinformation and disinformation out there. And also as illustrated in early part of this talk, really the power of patient advocacy. You now we think is really you know, you know, foundational in actually establishing uh, you know, long COVID as a condition and really shedding light on it, attracting attention to it and, 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 and putting it in the spotlight. So in summary, I hope I, I you know, gave you enough information to suggest that long COVID is a multifaceted disease. It can affect nearly every organ system. The burden of long COVID is evident even among those people who did not need to be hospitalized with COVID in the first place. Burden of long COVID is increased with the severity of the acute infection. Governments and health systems must adapt quickly and establish post-COVID care strategies. And last but not least, I'd like to thank my collaborators acknowledging our data scientists and the absolutely amazing Yan Shea, and Benjamin Bo, other team members, including Miao Kai, Andrew Gibson, Evan Shu, Taeyang Choi, and funding and administrative support from US Department of Veterans Affairs and, and others. And last but not least, and really most importantly, the long haulers who inspired us and continue to inspire us to do this work. 
I would not be doing work on long COVID had it not been for the inspiration that we got from them. So really very, very, very important kudos to the patient advocacy and patient-led research movement who really, you know, really inaugurated this field of study and, and, and spotlighted it and really attracted our attention and, and a lot of attention to it and much deserved attention, I have to say. And thank you very much and uh, looking forward to the panel discussion.